Um, so I, what I wanted to talk about today, um, well, actually, I should probably introduce myself. Um, my name's Stephen Walling. Um, I'm a, an ex-Portlander and an open source groupie. And by day, uh, I'm a product manager at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, and the Wikimedia Foundation is the 501c3 nonprofit donor funded that um, keeps Wikipedia and a whole host of other projects um, online. Um, and then alongside Wikipedia and its platform, um, we produce an open source wiki package called MediaWiki based in PHP um, that you can download and hack on. Um, you can go to git.wikimedia.org um, to download all of our source and check out everything, including crazy stuff like our Apache configurations and all kinds of stuff. Um, and so what I, what I wanted to talk about was um, some of the lessons that I think we've, we've started to figure out um, at the Wikimedia Foundation um, in regards to the interplay between data and privacy and the, the sense of trust we have with our users. Um, you know, sort of in the beginning of Wikipedia, um, uh, it was a very, very small team of people, um, less, than, less than 10 employees lots and lots of volunteers, and we were basically just trying to like play catch up with this thing that had been created. Um, and we didn't really um, think about data other than um, how, to, how to get rid of it or ignore it, um, so that, <laughs> because we weren't, we weren't really using it, and um, we certainly didn't want to collect information that might make people feel uncomfortable. Um, when you're asking people to release all of their work um, into the public, um, every single edit that they make into a publicly viewable log, um, that's a risky proposition. Um, and a lot of what's in our early privacy policy, the first revisions up until this year, um, reflects that. So this is a part from one of, one of the, the, the worst parts of the privacy policy, which is when a visitor re requests or, or reads a page or sends an email to a Wikimedia server, no more information is collected than is typically collected by websites, <laughs> which is incredibly vague and like totally useless. Um, like, even, ba even back in the, the early 2000s when, when this was originally written, that could have been everything from, you know, like ad-based pixel tracking to, you know, like no, no data collection because Google Analytics hadn't been invented yet and no one knew how to do these things. <laughs> um, a similar example is uh, the Wikimedia Fund Foundation may keep raw logs of such transactions, but these will not be published or used to track legitimate users. What a legitimate user was was completely undefined. Is it someone who reads the site? Is it someone who edits? Is it, you know, someone playing around with our code? Like, what, what the hell's going on? Um, so this was okay in a world where we didn't have to use data to fix things because Wikipedia was just sort of like growing magically on its own, getting really big, and we didn't have to do anything to improve upon the site other than basically just keep this um, contraption of duct tape and popsicle sticks like on the web enough so that people could edit the content and create things. Um, but around 2007, um, we, 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 did it, we actually looked at the totally public information um, uh, about what was happening with our, with our editor base. And you can't see all of this graph, and I, graph and I did that kind of on purpose. But um, it's charting two lines, one of which is just the total number of editors. Um, so people who make five or more edits a month and are registered on Wikipedia on the English version of, of the site. Um, and then the red, that's the blue line, and then the red line is um, the one-year retention rate of people who just joined. So if I join in 2007, how many of those people are retained over time? And basically what this, what this tells you is that around 2007 the, is the peak of the total active editorship of Wikipedia, and that around the same time what caused that problem was that the one-year retention rate of new editors who joined completely fell through the floor. It used to be almost close to 50%. And now it's 10 or 15 percent, um, and that's actually held steady. It hasn't gotten worse over time. So we were like, we call that the oh shit graph at the Wikimedia Foundation because it's the first time that we looked at a, a piece of data about um, Wikipedia that we could just find of, of the publicly information available information we had and um, figure out that we had a problem in terms of readership or editorship or anything like that. Um, and we also had a problem not just because um, we'd figure out that, that it was hard to edit Wikipedia, that people didn't um, necessarily know how to do that, and even when they, when they came to the site, it wasn't like an inviting culture and easy to use software and all that stuff. The other problem we had was, um, was a data problem. Um, and I wrote, I, I kind of like to frame this talk around um, two user stories, because I'm a product manager, like 
it's my job to help people like focus on what the users actually want. And when it comes to data and privacy and the interplay between them, I think there are two key user stories. And the first one is, as someone building software, this could be any of us, I need to know how users engage with an application so that I can make informed decisions. So that, if, you, if you're familiar with like lean methodology at all, this is, this is that we, we build software, um, whether it's open source or not, by um, making a product, measuring how people use it or fail to use it, learning something about that usage, and then incorporating that information back into the cycle of building things. Um, and so this, this user story, I think, is like absolutely essential to how we um, build open source software, whether it's in a community or for our day jobs or whatever. And, but obviously, you can totally take this data user story way too far, um, and it can have really nasty effects that, on people's privacy. Um, comprehensive data collection, obviously something that makes people feel really uncomfortable. Um, and the second user story is, I think, as someone using software, any piece of software, I need to have control over my data. So what, what is collected about me, for what purpose, who it's shared with, that kind of thing. Um, most reasonable definitions of privacy, I think, um, really, they tend to focus on the like what information is shared, but I think it's also really important to focus on what information is collected and stored at all to begin with. Um, and you can you can serve this user story way too far, like and way too comprehensively as well. I think. How many of you are familiar with a site called Pinboard? Okay, so Pinboard is basically a um, it's a it's a bookmarking site. Um, it, if you ever heard of Delicious or how you use your browser bookmarks, it stores your bookmarks for you. And unlike Delicious, it's not a free service. You pay $10 a month. Um, and privacy is a really big deal um, for Pinboard. It's one of their like, key selling features on what they do. And in their privacy policy, they actually explicitly say, we use Google Analytics on our public landing pages for people who aren't logged in. But anybody who's a paying user, basically everybody who uses the site on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we, don't, we, don't Google, like, we don't track or, or measure any of that behavior. We don't put Google Analytics on it at all. Um, and that's really great in the sense that it serves um, their users' need to feel like they have a sense of privacy, but it also completely screws them when it comes to the user story of, I need data to make informed decisions. Because qualitative data can tell you why someone does something. You can ask people why they do things, but if you actually want to accurately know what people are doing and how, you have to look at quantitative metrics. So you're basically saying, I'm going to go with my gut and make bad decisions about the products I build. We know that people are bad at predicting the outcome of um, the software that they use because you need to understand how users work. So my hypothesis when I, when I work at the foundation, when I build products um, for Wikipedia, is that we can find a balance between these two user stories. Um, and I can, I can get what I need as a product manager to make decisions about software, and, and so can the developers. Um, but we can do that while preserving people's sense of control over their data and, and privacy. Um, so how we do that. Um, the honest answer is I have actually no idea how we're going to do that. But um, there's a few things we do that I think are interesting and unusual that are probably um, good things to be aware of. Um, one of which is just considering the entire life cycle of data from the point it's collected, how we collect it, um, how we store it, how we retain it, and who, what we share and who we share that with. Um, and in order to like, have a good guide to what this is, um, I actually like to think that privacy policies are more important than not. Most people, whether it's open source projects or not, tend to sort of like throw up some legalese privacy policy that a lawyer wrote or some executives in collaboration with the lawyers wrote, um, and then never look at it again, never expect users to read it, and don't actually use it as a really good like everyday guide for how they do things and, and how their systems are built. Um, maybe they go consult lawyers and say, can we do this at all? I don't know. Um, and I think in particular, open source projects tend to sort of say that um, if we're not collecting data at all, we don't need a privacy policy, or it's not that important, we should have like just a code of conduct for contributors or something like that instead. Um, but if your privacy policy is your man page for how you collect, data, collect retain, and share data about people, um, that means the privacy policies need to be written for human beings, which they generally aren't. Um, that's why we have services like TOSDR, where you, have to, where you can go and look up a human readable summary of people's terms of service. I really encourage you to check this out. It's pretty interesting. This is a great, a great project, but it, it hints at this, this, this more core problem, which is that privacy policies aren't actually written for, for human beings or understandable or in, 
in relation to what we do every day as software developers or users. Um, and you see the effect of this in the products that we use every day. So this is a, this is a product that um, Facebook A-B tested and launched really recently called Privacy Checkup, where they, um, they try and use this like friendly dinosaur to guide you through um, like how, what your privacy settings are, like the huge mess of nasty things. Um, and I think it's, it's nice that they tried to put this like di little happy dinosaur humanizing touch, but I think how people actually experience Facebook <laughs> is like, it's, it's completely different. Like the whole thing is a mess. The fact that they, you don't understand the privacy policy, you can't read it, um, and they have to create some kind of guided tour means that this thing is kind of a monster. And we, in some ways, we, we considered going down this route too. So this year we rewrote our, we rewrote our privacy policy um, from completely from scratch. It took us about six or seven months in total. Um, and in the first iterations, one of the key features of the new privacy policy was this character, Rory, this tiger who represented the legal team, who was gonna like guide you through how the privacy policy worked and all of the like ridiculous detail that went into it. Um, and and uh, we could write it in legalese, but Rory would be along the side to sort of like explain what the terms of the privacy policy really were. Um, it turns out we totally ditched that and instead just wrote the privacy policy in the most plain human language we could think of. Um, it's still really huge. It's still not perfect. Um, but we didn't try and sort of like let ourselves get off easy by um, writing this legalese like um, sort of privacy policy and then augmenting it with some kind of like human, human usable friendly little like, like paint on the side. Um, and I think the other interesting thing about the way that we, we wrote this privacy policy um, and something that open source projects in particular are really um, poised to do is work with users to co-create privacy standards. So instead of having a system where um, how data is handled um, and what's stored and collected um, comes down on high from a collaboration between like um, lawyers and, and software engineers, getting users involved from the get-go and saying, here's our draft of what we're thinking, here's what we want to do, here are the problems we want to solve, um, are you comfortable with that, um, how does that work, that kind of thing. Um, does this language make sense? Um, if you're writing a, a privacy policy for human beings, having actual human beings who aren't yourselves um, read the thing and help you edit drafts of it um, sounds like a pretty good idea to me. And how we did this was, of course, we used a wiki. Um, we have this, this, this meta wiki that we use um, for about sort of like movement-wide, all Wikipedia across all of its languages issues. And um, the first thing we did was we, we took our first draft of our privacy policy as soon as, as soon as we wrote it, and we put it on this public wiki that anybody could edit with a talk page associated with that privacy policy. Um, and we spent the next five and a half months discussing the policy and editing it in collaboration with our users, um, in, including developers and then end editors of, of Wikipedia and readers who'd never participated in this discussion before. Um, and I think what came out of it was an actual sense of like ownership of the privacy policy and what's in it among the entire Wikipedia community of developers and, and, and end users, um, rather than a, a set of demands that we were making on users that they weren't, weren't comfortable with. Um, but even if you, even if, even if you do that, um, you, I think a, a lot of people are, um, they have this privacy policy. Let's say you, you've written it with human beings. It's really nice and wonderful. Um, but in terms of the content of the thing and how your system actually works, um, I think one of the key differences of Wikipedia compared to definitely every other top 10 website and even many open source projects is that we own the entirety of our data pipeline. So from the moment that we collect a piece of information about a, a visitor on the site um, to the end of we publish a, a, a batch of logs or give a researcher access to um, a data API that tells them about user data or something like that, we completely own that, that pipeline. Um, uh, the cost in that is, of course, that we had to build or, or re-engineer other people's open source code to, to build the entirety of our thing. Um, most projects these days, I think people just sort of automatically fall back on using something like Google Analytics or Mixpanel or Optimizely to do these kind of things. And it's a lot more work to do something alternative like build your, build your event pipeline. And we, we had to do this um, early in my team's history. We, when, we, when we started wanting to run A-B tests to sort of figure out what was going on in Wikipedia, 
we didn't really have um, a tool to do client-side or server-side instrumentation of data, and we had to build that um, event bus and like tool for um, storing that data. Um, now, one of the ways that I think we're, we're able to um, like reduce the amount of data that we had to collect in the, in the first place or worry about storing or um, worry about whether users were going to be comfortable with it is that um, we think of data as um, a tool for answering a question. And if, if, a, if data is a tool for answering a question, it doesn't just mean that you collect everything that's possible um, and sort of dump it somewhere and then comb through it later, like digging for gold, looking for answers. It means that um, whether you're collecting a qualitative survey, like this gender survey we ran at users um, for, for like one week right after they signed up, we asked people um, how many of you are male or how many of you identify as female um, or how many of you prefer not to say to get a handle on what the um, gender distribution of accounts were. Um, like the alternative um, style to this is to um, make it part of like a profile creation process or put it in user preferences, um, or just like periodically survey users um, every single six months or, or randomly via email or something like that. But instead we said, at the time we had a question which was, of the people who are, are signing up for an account, how many of them identify as men and how many of them identify as women? And so we just decided to run a survey like this um, immediately um, rather than sort of like collect data on an ongoing basis. Um, I think the other, the other big thing we do is that um, we're completely transparent about um, what kind of data we collect. So the problem with privacy policies is that they can't like prescriptively say in the future everything that we're going to do, um, every single piece of data that we're going to collect. They can tell you maybe how, like we, we do pixel tracking or we don't do pixel tracking or we use cookies or we don't use cookies. We share people, uh, data with third parties or we don't share data with third parties. But it doesn't say when you sign up for an account, we're going to know um, which, which of the form fields you um, actually entered, um, how, how long it took you to click the sign up button, um, and other things like that. So how we tried to, to make that a little bit more transparent is that um, as a part of our um, client and server side instrumentation, um, we use this tool called uh, event logging. And um, how event logging works is that um, it basically, the events it collects are, um, it's basically just a JSON schema. Um, so we, we define an upfront, here's the schema of events we want to collect. Um, a product manager and or a data analyst sit down and they write it together and it's kind of a contract with that, between the two of them about um, what it is that they um, want to collect. And then when they're ready to, this, this data, this schema actually gets published in a wiki page. So we made a namespace in our wiki that just accepts JSON and our actual event tracking system goes to the wiki, looks at that, that, that JSON schema, and says, this is how it is. So this is how it looks like when you, when you actually edit it. Um, and all of that's, all of that's public. Um, we get around the fact that anyone could edit this, um, so we're not breaking our, our event like collection, data, data collection, by just using um, selected revisions of the thing. We say revision two of, of that schema is the one that we actually validate um, against when we're collecting events. Um, but anybody can come along and see what, exactly what information that we're collecting about them um, and how. Um, and you can go to MetaNow and look in the schema namespace and, and look up um, what we collect on account creation, um, what we collect when you edit, what we collect when you read, all that stuff. Um, so, but then even when we're, we're transparent about um, just like general methods we use um, and exact like pieces of data we're collecting, um, that still doesn't get around the fact that some people are going to want to um, not participate in that thing. Um, and I think unusually compared to, to many sites, we use both opt-in and opt-out options for, for data collection. So for instance, um, this is an opt-in for um, a set of beta features, sort of like Gmail Labs that we use. And then this is, this is one opt-in method we use for sort of like collecting new data about a feature by getting users to try it out. The other method we use is just giving people the complete and utter ability, like a, a single preference to opt out of all A-B testing on the site um, altogether. When you register an account, you can go in and, and say, um, I don't want to participate in experimental features at all. Um, I don't want to see that stuff. Um, and then when we run an A-B test, we, we say if that user has that preference enabled, they never participated in the A-B test um, at all. Um, and that was, that was kind of a difficult decision because um, the urge, whoops, 
sorry, uh, the urge in an A-B test is to have like comprehensive data collection and sort of like um, have things really like objectively run in a way that we, we think um, we're sort of like learning everything we can in an experiment. Um, and the thought that um, we might let potentially every single one of the registered editors and or users on the site opt out of A-B tests is kind of a scary thing. But it turns out that when you give people um, greater control and more, more options for what kind of data is collected about them, that actually um, creates this sense of trust between you and your users so that they're actually com more comfortable with you running A-B tests um, and uh, collecting more detailed data about them. We use like basically every method that a site like um, Google or Facebook does in terms of like um, pixel pixel based tracking, um, cookie based stuff, all that all that kind of thing. The only big one of the big differences is we don't share any of that data with third parties. Um, but when we run A/B tests, we're not sort of like hobbling ourselves and just anonymizing all the data. Um, and I think we're able to do that because um, our users know that if they don't want to participate in that, if they don't want to help improve. Wikipedia in the site, they're, they're able to just sort of opt out of that and, and not participate. Um, and that sort of like flips the, flips the, um, the, the dichotomy on its head. Instead of saying, these are all the things we want to collect about it, don't use the site if you don't want to do that. Instead, we're saying, when we collect data on the site, when we run A-B tests, when we, when we um, analyze stuff, um, really what we're asking is for you to help us learn how to make Wikipedia better. Um, and then I think the other big thing we do is um, like purging and aggregating data as much as humanly possible. Um, there's basically only like three methods for, for taking a set of data, like say we run an A-B test and we collect um, how many people fill, filled, out, filled out like say a gender option on a, on a form field or your IP address as you were editing or something like that. Um, we are able to, to feel more comfortable and make our users feel more comfortable when we collect that data because um, at the end of, say, a 90-day or a 60-day period afterwards, we take that data and we either aggregate it so that we say it's this number of accounts that took these actions or we just get rid of it completely um, and say, we've answered that question, we don't need that data anymore, and we can get rid of it. Um, a, a really good example of this is a tool called Check User. So, on Wikipedia, um, there's a very small, like less than ten um, group, less than ten group, large group of people who are regular Wikipedia users, um, but they're elected by other users, having been on the site a really long time, um, so they can look up for on an individual accounts basis what IPs you edit from, so that exposes your location and a bunch of other potentially private data, as well as um, how many accounts you've used on the site. So you can register as many accounts as you want on Wikipedia. Um, but if you abuse those, then you can be blocked. Um, like say if you, you try and do vote rigging in a, in a discussion by registering multiple accounts. So check user is really a tool for accounting for that, that, that potential for abuse. Um, but it's also really dangerous because we're, um, it's the only time on the site that we collect um, IPs of registered editors. Um, and IPs of registered editors is something that we could be subpoena for, subpoenaed for when we get sued because someone doesn't like something that you wrote in a Wikipedia page. So we're, we're making a really like, uh, like it's a, it's a dangerous trade-off in like combating abuse on the site versus collecting information that we could potentially have to share with third parties in a legal setting about um, users' locations and, and where they edit from. Um, so how we deal with that is that we collect this information and then we throw it out every 30 days. So we say, um, you, can, you can register as many accounts as you want, you can sign up and do this stuff, and we'll be able to figure out um, if we need to on, on a on a case by case basis um, whether you're abusing multiple accounts. But when we've answered that question, um, we throw away this data. Um, I think the other big thing that we learned um, in the last couple of years is that there's literally no th such thing as like real anonymization. Um, if you have more than one data point that identifies an individual, you can correlate those two things in some fashion um, and learn something about that. Um, the probably the, the the single biggest mistake we made in that, that convinced us that anonymization is not really such a great idea, and instead you should either not not collect the data to begin with, purge it quickly, or 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 whatever, is um, when we decided to um, take a data set of what people were searching for on Wikipedia 
and um, anonymize it, so remove any information about the IP addresses of the readers who were searching for things, and just say what were the, what, what were the search query strings that um, people were looking for when they, when they typed things in in Wikipedia, boy, wouldn't that be such a really cool data set to release to the world to tell people what, 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 what people search for on Wikipedia in aggregate form. Well, it turns out that's a really stupid idea, and all we ha would have had to do is actually like search Wikipedia to, to figure that out. Um, because in 2006, AOL research already found this out. It turns out users, when you give them a text box, text box they can paste things in it that are already in their, their like copy and paste bin. And that will, inc that will inevitably include things like social security numbers, email addresses, the contents of email addresses, their phone number, their bank account statements, their passwords, everything that is potentially private. Someone will paste that stuff in a search box somewhere. Um, and when you have uh, search data on the order of a site like AOL or, or Wikipedia, it's going to be in there. So in, in, you can see in the update um, here, like short, shortly afterwards, like a couple hours after we published this blog post, um, one of our community developers was like, hey, idiots, you might want to take that down. Um, and thankfully, no one actually downloaded that search data in that time. Uh, no. Because um, it was on dumps.wikipedia.org, so we know how many downloads it had. Um, and then even after all of that, after um, um, being really careful about what kind of data we, we collect and release in the first place, being totally transparent about um, how it's collected and when and when we run A-B tests, letting people opt out of it, um, not sharing information with third parties, not collecting private information about um, uh, individual accounts IP addresses um, over time, all of that stuff. Um, like at the end of the day, everybody still has a different definition of what they think the, the right amount of privacy is and what that means. Um, and that even on a site like Wikipedia, um, people will come and complain about stuff. So for in, a really good example of this in my mind is um, this tool that um, a community developer made on our, on our labs infrastructure called the Deep Wiki Inspector. And um, when users sign up for an account and every single time you make an edit, there's a very prominent warning that says, um, this will be public forever. You don't get to go back and retract your edits. Um, it's associated with a timestamp and what pages and the accounts that you edited from, all that stuff. Um, and if you want to be anonymous, you can either not sign up for an account or you can edit pseudonymously. Um, don't use your real name when you sign up. That's totally fine. And no one will be able to find out who you are. But the flip side of that is that because every single one of your edits is public, you can do slightly creepy things with it, like look up, in this case, the Deep Wiki Inspector is telling you um, what days of the week and what hours of the days I, I most edited on Wikipedia. So you can tell, basically, if I'm editing Wikipedia during my day job or whether I'm only editing during the weekends. Now, all of this data is public. We tell users about it when they sign up and when they edit. Um, and we also say, you know, like if you don't, if you don't want to tell us who you are, so that this has no relation to your real life identity, that's totally fine. But even in that case, um, uh, the German Wikipedia community decided that this was a really terrible thing. They had a completely different standard of privacy, and they said, even though all of this data that that we release into the the public is there, um, let's let's just make this tool obscure or maybe shut it down um, and not run it ourselves. And the fact that anybody could go and co download a dump of all of Wikipedia edits and do this analysis themselves, even if we didn't support it, didn't make any difference to them whatsoever. Um, so you can't please everyone when it comes to uh, like data and privacy, even if you're completely transparent about it. Um, so that's actually all I had other than a cheap call to um, come work with us. We're 200 people in San Francisco, um, and we're hiring both engineering and non-engineering oh, positions. Yeah, well, I'd say, I'd say like, a, what is it, like half? We're, ha we're half remote. The office is in San Francisco, but people like Arthur and Sumina are remote too, um, including there's a, people, a couple people from Portland. So questions? Nothing? Crickets? Go ahead.
Yeah, so, I mean, the fact that we used this wiki is basically because that's what our, what our users are used to. I mean, if I was, if I was like in, in an open source project um, and writing a new policy from scratch and, and you had like a smaller developer community or something, I probably wouldn't use this at all. Like, there are still major usability problems with wiki text talk pages. We're actually redoing the discussion system on Wikipedia for that reason. So I actually wouldn't necessarily recommend like using this exact tool set. Um, other things that we've used internally that, um, that do this, obviously like mailing lists, like we discussed this on the mailing list for ages and ages in addition to the, the talk page. Um, other interesting tools that we've tried out in include a tool called Lumio, which is open source it's, um, and it's based out of a, a company in, in New Zealand that lets you do um, like collaborative discussions and polling in a really, really easy way. Um, yeah, it's called L-O-O-M-I-O. -O -O um, we use that internally for making decisions and like um, running surveys and stuff all the time. Um, so I, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily use a wiki if that's not what your community is used to. Yeah. Zoom in up. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the other, the, the, other than the, the um, momentary like publishing of search data, probably the single stupidest thing that we still do on Wikipedia when it comes to like data and privacy is that when you're anonymous, when, you, when, you, when you're anonymous, when you don't register for an account, um, that edit is saved with your IP address, which is public. Um, which makes absolutely no sense because we call it anonymous editing, but in, in most ways you're actually less anonymous than you would be if you, were, if you registered an account and you were pseudonymous. Um, so if I signed up as like random Portland person number 12, like that IP address would never be exposed to the public um, ever. So like changing, changing that as we work on like ways to invite people to register more is something that we're doing over the next year because it really makes no sense that anybody except a privileged user who wants to like prevent abuse on Wikipedia needs to have access to that, that piece of information. We make up for it in the meantime by like loudly warning you that that's the case and inviting you to sign up or, or log in, but it's, it's kind of a dumb thing. Yeah, it, it just saves the log as like edited by IP address 17 blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah, which could be any, any like, it's, it's kind of, yeah, exactly. Or in some cases, like, there are IP addresses that represent, like, entire countries. So, yeah, like, uh, like Qatar is on one, one, the entire country is, uses one IP address. Go ahead. That's a really good question. So it, it depends. So when it comes to like um, the like schema information, so when we run like an A-B test or something, the first thing we do, actually that, that's actually something I should have put in the talk is that we, we separate out the, the stages of like um, just like collecting something and then deciding, deciding to share it really clearly. Um, so like when we run an A-B test and we have the schema, all of that data only someone, whether it's a community community developer or a staff member, only someone who signed an NDA gets access to the actual log data um, that comes out of all of these event logging schemas. So before we publish it, um, we decide whether we want to do that at all, whether we want to aggregate it, whether it should be part of the regular dumps, what like how it, how that should work, um, so that there's like an extra step in between collecting the data and deciding what's what's shared with the public. Josh. Yeah. So I'm just curious to know, as a, as a proportion of the total number of volunteers, right. how many participated in the discussion over the years? Um, a proportion of the total number of, like, say, like active editors? Yes. That's a good question. Um, 
I mean, I wouldn't even say it was more, like, it couldn't even remotely be higher than, like, 50% of active registered users. Like, it's a small, it, fif, like, I don't actually know the, the proportion, but it, it's definitely, like, a very small proportion of self-selected people who are interested in meta stuff who participated in that. The number, the total number of individual people who participated in the discussion was 500, but that also included readers and developers and like, everybody who was basically not a staff member. But it doesn't, it doesn't tell us anything about like, which communities those people, came, those people came from, how active an editor they were. There's 75,000 active editors, so the math between 500 participants and 75,000 active editors is the proportion. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why we provide, um, I think there's, there's one thing we haven't done yet and then the other things we are doing. So that's, the thing we've already done now is that's why we provide the like A-B testing opt out, don't participate in experimental features. Um, if a feature is a beta feature, you have to opt in to try it, um, that kind of thing. Because those are the things we collect data about. We don't, um, any, and except for like the public edit logs, we don't collect data on an ongoing basis about things other than that. Um, I think the other thing that we're doing, we, or that we should do, is a part of the like sign up and login work is actually ask inform people about what the privacy policy is and how it works when they sign up rather than just when they edit right now that's the point that's the part where we give people a like this is the policy you're agreeing to hey go read it um, tool which works because it's it's like um, it works it works for both unregistered and registered people but actually considering the people who want to sign up and participate in Wikipedia more and like telling them about that policy when they sign up is probably something we should be doing. Yeah, the, the, the single, yeah, yeah, it applies to every single, every single site. So when we, how we actually like um, put out a call for people to participate is we just ran banners like publicly including to readers to like every single visitor on every single Wikimedia project for like a week or two. Um, do you remember, do you have, like, did you do special like target outreach? Do you remember how much participation you got from other languages? From other, other languages? Yeah, so um, part of that drafting of the privacy policy was the, was the translation part of it. Um, so every single translation we do of the policy and also of the user interface is by volunteers. So um, in order to actually even just get the thing translated, we had to do outreach to people who, didn't, who weren't on English Wikipedia, who were on you know, like other language wikis in order to get them to like read the thing and translate it. Um, I would say most of the participation came from like the big languages we have of like English, German, French, Russian, that kind of thing. Like it's not an equal distribution of people, but um, like multilingualism and multiculturalism was definitely like a part of the process. I mean, it, it's difficult. We don't, we don't actually know. Um, I would say, yeah, I, I mean, it, it depends. When we, when we look at, like, the kind of Wikipedia editor who signs up who's, like, 14 and, like, what the world that they're used to is, like, 
Facebook and that that level of like privacy. Um, I think they definitely probably have different expectations than the kind of Wikipedia user who's like um, been on the site for ten years and is like a, a free software developer who participates in the site and, and that kind of thing. Those people like obviously have completely different understandings of of what what privacy really is. Um, whether there's changes we should make to the design of the site to accommodate like the the different understanding those people have, I don't know. Um, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, The tour thing is interesting with Wikipedia. So we we work as hard as we can to like not collect data about people, but we actually like block all like you can't you, you can read Wikipedia using a tool like Tor, but you can't edit Wikipedia using a, a tool like Tor. There, it's completely blo like we block all Tor nodes from from editing. And uh, if you want to edit via Tor, you have to sign up for an account and then go request an exemption for that account. Like there's a flag on the account that site administrators can set to let you do that. So I actually kind of think it's like sort of a crappy state when it comes to editing. When it comes to reading, it's not, like it doesn't really make much of a difference and it's such a small proportion of our editorship that um, it doesn't matter. But it, uh, the editing thing seems, I think is in some ways more important to us because those kind of people are the, are the ones who, um, you know, like if you if you edit LGBT topics from Iran, like having being able to edit via Tor and get an exemption is like really important to you probably. Whereas like um, the kind of person who's like an American software developer who just wants to read Wikipedia via Tor, like there's no there's nothing stopping them from doing that. Okay. Well, if that's it, I knew that I was going to end way earlier because I'm used to having only 10 minutes to talk, not 45. <laughs> so, thanks, everyone. <laughs>